Welcome. You're a, you're a fortunate group. You have some sense of history and the importance of history. Uh, I'm uh, Gaddis Smith of the History Department, uh, former denizen of this building. And it's a great pleasure first to acknowledge and thank the grandson of Colonel House, who is here, Ed Auchincloss. And it's Ed's inspiration and support that led to persuading our speaker and author to undertake this wonderful book, now published by the Yale University Press. I want to welcome Godfrey Hodgson and introduce him as one of a line of people from Great Britain who say going back to James Bryce more than a century ago have helped Americans understand themselves and have helped the people of Great Britain understand Americans. I think also of someone who is a half contemporary overlapping uh, with Godfrey Alastair Cook. And it's a wonderful benefit for Americans to have such perceptive people. Godfrey Hodgson has been, for much of his career, a journalist covering the United States. He did an important book on the election of 1968, when the country was then racked in turmoil over another war. He's a historian. He's a biographer. He wrote a wonderful biography of another colonel, Colonel Henry L. Stimson, and one of Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And in doing this book, he served all of us a great, provided a great service because there's a Yale connection with Colonel House because he, through Charles Seymour, who was a part of the American delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, became close friends, and Charles Seymour persuaded Colonel House to give his extraordinary collection of papers, including a marvelous diary uh, to Yale, and they've been in the historical archives at Yale for all these years since the early 1920s, and hundreds of students, graduate students, professors, writers, have drawn sustenance from that collection, but there has never been a rounded biography until this time. And in this book and through the work of our speaker, we see not only the importance of Colonel House at the time as right-hand man to Woodrow Wilson during the First World War, but also how events of that time are still resonating in the problems all of us on this earth are facing today. So welcome to you, Godfrey. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I should add uh, my thanks to uh, uh, Professor Gaddy Smith for his help on this whole project from, from our first meeting some, I guess, five years ago now. I want to start by asking why it is relevant now to look at the life of Colonel House. There are, I think, a number of points that I should make before I develop my, my argument. The first is that the second decade of the 20th century uh, was a very crucial decade. It was the last time, in my opinion, that the world was truly malleable. I mean, the, the world of international politics was plastic, malleable, could be changed. And then as a result of the failures at the end of the First World War, uh, we all moved into a consequential train of events which led from war to revolution to economic recession and depression to the rise of fascism to war again to Holocaust and to the Cold War. And it's only in the very last few years that we thought we might be escaping from this uh, ominous sequence. Now, a number of people, including some of the reviewers of this book, have compared Colonel House to Karl Rove. Uh, the only similarity, 
that I can see is that they were both from Texas. But um, it is certainly the case that Colonel Huss played a crucial role in the development of a, a style, a way of handling international affairs, international relations, which the United States has followed, not uh, in any kind of slavish or automatic way, but uh, has generally followed ever since. He was the first of a sequence of presidential advisors, of whom Harry Hopkins uh, in the Roosevelt administration, George Bundy, uh, Kennedy's uh, national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, you know, are in the same tradition. And I think it's also important to see how many of the vital issues of international affairs today first surfaced in those crucial years of Colonel House's uh, working uh, political life, the five years from 1914 to 1919. Then, as now, it was a question of American world leadership. It was a question of how willing and how enthusiastic Americans were to embrace that leadership and, and, to, uh, uh, and to accept its burdens. There was the question of what has come to be known as Wilsonian policy, the idea that it was the destiny uh, and even the duty of the United States to spread its, its version of democracy around the world. That is very much a live issue today. Before the present administration in Washington, the Clinton administration was explicitly Wilsonian. There was a strange episode right at the beginning of that, of that administration. It's been rather forgotten now in which uh, the president, his uh, UN ambassador, Madeleine Albright, uh, his Secretary of State, uh, Warren Christopher, and Tony Lake, his national security advisor, all made speeches, clearly in a coordinated pattern, uh, to advocate what they called Wilsonian policies. And of course, uh, President George W. Bush has also adopted a kind of rather militant version of the Wilsonian uh, uh, dream. But also I think even behind these particular issues there is a matter of the, the whole style and tone uh, with which the United States has dealt with the rest of the world. Uh, one key uh, factor in that has been the reluctance to embrace professional diplomats and to operate as far as possible by a number of people who'd, who'd uh, commended themselves by work in other fields, in international law, as academics, as bankers, um, and as uh, what used to be known as dollar-a-year men. That's people who have so much money they don't need to work for wages. In any case, this began with a strange encounter, September the 24th, 1911, when Woodrow Wilson, who was running for president of the United States, paid a brief visit to a private gentleman from Texas who was living in an apartment at the Gotham Apartments on East 53rd Street in Manhattan. It was the first time they'd met, and the meeting went well, so well, that within a year, uh, Colonel House uh, had become a key member of Wilson's campaign team. After Wilson was inaugurated president, House became his intimate friend, his trusted political counselor, and in effect, his assistant president for foreign policy. The friendship was not cronyism. They didn't play poker together like President Harding, uh, Harding or President Truman with their buddies, but it was a remarkably close friendship. These two inhibited Victorian Southern gentlemen found they could engage in long, earnest conversations about beauty, poetry, love, and death. There's a, there's a, a vignette which I um, cherish uh, of these two gentlemen being driven out to the Rock Creek Cemetery uh, in Washington, which is not actually close to Rock Creek. It's on the hill by the, by the soldier's home uh, in the north of the district. And there they sat uh, before August St. Gowden's wonderful sculpture uh, to commemorate uh, Henry Adams's wife, uh, Clover. And they had a long and very personal conversation uh, in front of that astonishingly beautiful statue. House once dictated to his diary that he tried all of his life to find, quote, someone with whom he could work out the things he had so deeply at heart. He said he was despairing of doing so when Wilson gave him the opportunity for which I was longing. Uh, 
Wilson went even further. Mr. House, he said once, is my second personality. He's my independent self. His thoughts and mine are one, and it was as if we had known each other forever. Now, that's a pretty striking, uh, that's pretty striking language for a, a powerful uh, intellectual uh, man who was um, by then president of the United States. And uh, I think the closeness of that friendship, as well as the achievements of that friendship, have tended to be blotted out by uh, a pretty hostile press that, uh, uh, that, if one can say a press, when one's talking about historians, uh, about the hostile accounts that, uh, that have been given by historians uh, of Colonel House and of his relationship uh, with Woodrow Wilson. In the end, as we shall see, that friendship did not endure, but while it did last for the seven years from 1912 to 1919, uh, which was a critical time, not just in those two men's lives, but in the history of the United States and indeed in the history of the world, the closeness was not only extraordinary, it was a political fact of cardinal importance. Wilson trusted House to the point of giving him authority over the whole process of assembling his administration with all the patronage that conveyed. From 1914 to 1919, House spent much of his time in Europe as the president's confidential emissary, or if you like, secret agent. No private citizen before or since has ever been given so much authority by a president to act on his behalf on the world stage. Before the World War began, World War I began in Europe, House saw the German Kaiser and the British government in an effort to prevent the war. He would have seen the French government too if it hadn't been distracted at the time by what is known as a crime passionnel. The wife of the finance minister had walked into the offices of the editor of Le Figaro, the major newspaper, and shot him dead over the paper's revelations of her love letters. After the war had started, House did everything he could to stop it. In particular, he worked to bring out about a negotiated settlement, but the European powers uh, were not ready for that. And I think the reason for that, for me, is summed up in a, a casual remark made by one of the senior diplomats that House had become friendly with in London, and House was pressing the case for a negotiated end to the war. Uh, this man, Sir William Tyrrell, uh, reminded House that the second of his two sons had been killed at the front the previous week. And people had got so involved, so angry, so emotional, uh, that the chances of a negotiated settlement were, were pretty remote. The Germans thought they didn't need one because they thought they were going to win, and the British and French were damned if they were going to have a negotiated settlement because they thought they too would win in the end, and they were determined to do so. After the United States got into the war, House did what he could to ensure victory, and after the war was over, he was the president's trusted emissary in negotiating an armistice to bring it to an end, and at the peace conference in Paris, he was at first second only to Wilson as the most influential delegate. Then things went wrong. Wilson lost confidence in him. There was no confrontation or open break, but House was effectually squeezed out. After Wilson's illness, he didn't even reply to House's letters, and House was not even invited uh, by the widow uh, to Wilson's funeral. Woodrow Wilson, when he first met House, was running for president uh, as an unusual candidate. Only two years before, he was a highly controversial president of Princeton University. He'd become governor of New Jersey. Uh, he had already acquired a habit of quarreling those, with those who had helped him, uh, which was not particularly um, a happy or useful uh, habit, and, and one which uh, was, uh, uh, for which uh, Colonel House was to pay dearly himself. Wilson cared little and knew little about the practicalities of politics. He did understand that he needed to reach out beyond the traditional democratic South and also beyond the Wall Street men who were only too keen to help him if he were to be elected as only the second Democrat to be president since the Civil War. One Democrat before uh, president on two occasions, but, but he would have been only the second. He was only the second. A Democrat since um, Appomattox. Colonel House was not a military man. He was a Texas colonel. That's to say he'd been given the title by a progressive governor of, of Texas for whom he worked, Jim Hogg. Uh, he'd inherited some wealth from his father, an English immigrant pastry cook, uh, 
who built up a fortune in land and business in Houston before the Civil War. House served Hogg in Austin, and he became the sort of kingmaker behind three subsequent governors of Texas. He built up a sort of genteel, unofficial machine of moderate to conservative politicians in Texas, but his private views uh, were increasingly progressive ones. Wilson offered him the chance of going national and advising a president as he'd advised four governors of Texas. House did not make Wilson president, but through his friends he did help to throw Texas his way, which was important. He did keep William Jennings Bryan on board, uh, which was important because there there were still those who would have preferred to go down to defeat yet again with Bryan rather than to win with somebody else um, and, and, as it happened, with Wilson. And House did sort out a very unpleasant and unnecessary quarrel uh, between the two joint managers of the of the Wilson campaign. Wilson was sufficiently grateful that when he won, House became immediately the man to see in the Wilson administration. Wilson could not be bothered with the sordid details of patronage. He handed over all the political influence that patronage gives to House, who did a good and fair job, but did take care to place what he called four or five warm personal friends in key posts, among them uh, the State Department, the Treasury, uh, the uh, Department of Justice, Department of the Interior, and the London Embassy, which was a kind of a good start to influence in any administration. House and his wife had been in the habit of traveling in Europe, so they already saw the signs of approaching war uh, more clearly than many Americans did uh, in the summer of 1914, and he tried in a rather extraordinary episode to prevent the war. His idea was to distract Germany, Britain, and France from their quarrels and to get them involved instead jointly with the United States in low interest rate investments in what House called the wild places of the earth. Interestingly, that then included Mexico, China, and Iran. One of the ideas, I think, was that House was anxious to to find fields for development and for American investment that were not part of the British and French and other European empires because that would have aroused a good deal of resentment and resistance uh, in uh, London and Paris. Uh, and, And so... He had this uh, idea, which has a certain modern resonance of using uh, development as a way of bringing together potentially rival powers. It might have worked. I'm not sure that it really was likely to have worked. I'm very struck by the fact that Sir Edward Grey, who became an intimate friend of House's and who was a, a party to this project, doesn't in fact mention it in his memoirs, which I think suggests that that Gray perhaps didn't take it quite as seriously as House did. In any case, that's academic because then the Archduke was murdered in Sarajevo. It was the beginning of June when when House had a a visit with the the Kaiser, bizarre meeting at Potsdam. Um, And by the end of of June, uh, the European system was falling apart as, as one power after another mobilized its armed forces and didn't know how to stop. Once the war had begun, House was back in Europe again, seeing his friends in London, seeing high officials in Berlin, and developing also some important contacts in Paris. After complex negotiations, he did get Sir Edward Grey to agree to a plan for a negotiated peace. The idea was that President Wilson would convene a peace conference. If the Germans refused to go along, then Wilson would commit the United States to fight with Britain, France, and Russia against Germany. Wilson agreed to this scheme, but he then wrote in the word the United States would, quote, probably, unquote, declare war on Germany. Well, nobody was really prepared to to commit themselves to a deal when the other party was only probably prepared to go along with it. So although House loyally supported that and said it was perfectly, the word probably didn't, didn't make any difference, the fact is it was fatal. House was disappointed. He also reacted by being very critical of the British for not seizing the opportunity to end the war uh, he had tried to give them. He, uh, he quarreled with the British quite a bit about the, the question of freedom of the seas. Uh, Americans, uh, since Jefferson, had seen the freedom of the seas as a, as a legitimate uh, 
interest, whereas the British had seen it as stripping them of their, their great uh, weapon in international relations, which was the ability to use uh, the Royal Navy uh, to boycott um, countries that were uh, hostile. In any case, House shared Wilson's distaste for traditional diplomacy, and specifically he shared, though I don't think with quite the same passion, Wilson's suspicion of the Allies' plans for post-war peace. These plans were enshrined in what came to be known as the secret treaties. And to a considerable extent, these secret treaties were really deals whereby Britain and France offered rewards to Russia, uh, to Italy, uh, to Romania, and to Greece. If they would come in the war on their side, then they would be given as well as uh, financial rewards, they would be given hunks of the territory of the of the uh, uh, the central powers. So, House, because he agreed with this this need to to have a new approach to di to post war diplomacy, he went along with uh, Wilson's call to set up a body to study what American post war aims ought to be. <coughs> And they set up what was called the inquiry. Uh, the idea was to hammer out American war aims in line with Wilson's ambition to use the war as an opportunity to impose American ideals on the world and to do so in what Wilson saw as a more American way, uh, open uh, uh, covenants openly agreed on. It wasn't that easy to find people who could produce detailed um, papers on the post-war situation in Europe, and House was driven back on two groups of people who I think of as being the Brahmins and the exiles. Um, the Brahmins were those patrician, uh, mainly New Englanders, uh, overwhelmingly from three universities, from this one, from Harvard and from Princeton, um, who had actually traveled in Europe. Some of them had spent a year or, uh, either a German or a French university. Um, and um, uh, many of them admitted that they had only a fairly skin-deep knowledge of the politics of Europe, but they were extremely able people, many of whom went on to have brilliant academic careers. Uh, Wallace Nerdstein, who wrote the great book about Brit England on the uh, uh, verge of, of civil war, um, Charles Homer Haskins, the great Homer medievalist, E.S. Corwin of Princeton Constitutional Authority, and, and many other people of the same, same weight. Um, I think that that was the beginning of a process that that has gone on ever since, which involved, among other things, taking foreign policy out of the State Department, where it had always lived before, and uh, also bringing in uh, outsiders to support the president in his own foreign policies, and doing bringing in, in particular, these two groups of people, academic uh, pundits, uh, and specifically people with s s special knowledge of uh, European problems and European countries uh, because they were refugees from those countries. And that's the beginning of a, of a process which uh, leads us to, uh, to Henry Kissinger and his uh, uh, despiteful treatment of, of William Rogers, the Secretary of the State. Uh, and uh, uh, even more recently, we've seen a Secretary of State in Colin Powell sidelined because he uh, disagreed with the president about policy. As it happened, the, the inquiry produced a huge body of work, uh, including some uh, you know, impressive pieces of, of research. But its greatest achievement came almost before it had begun work, because led by Walter Lippmann, who was involved, uh, the inquiry people um, came up with a draft for what became uh, President Wilson's, I suppose, most famous speech, uh, the 14 points speech. Um, what happened was that Lippmann and, and others from the inquiry uh, produced actually two separate draft papers. Uh, House came down uh, from New York. He refused to move to Washington, by the way. He continued to live in either in New York or, or in a, a cottage on the North Shore of Massachusetts uh, throughout. Um, and he came down uh, with this draft and the uh, he, he sat down 
Um, he said, he actually boasted in his diary, we sat down to work at half past 10 in the morning and we finished remaking the map of the world at half past 12. Now, they were able to do so because the, the draft of the speech which uh, House helped Wilson with was very closely based uh, on the inquiry's uh, paper. And some of the historians who are critical uh, of um, House's influence on Wilson and critical or, or simply deny that he had great influence uh, have to, attempted to deny this. But actually, if you read the two papers side by side, it's extremely plain that the 14-point speech was closely based on the inquiry's uh, report. House's influence was even greater, perhaps, on an even more important vision of Wilson's, and that was the drafting of the Covenant of the League of Nations. The idea for something like a League of Nations was not new. It had been kicking around before the war and during the war in Europe, both in Britain and in France. It was very much an idea whose time had come. House's role was to shape an idea into a specific policy and to produce a policy paper, uh, which was the beginning of the process of hammering out uh, a League of Nations which could be accepted by the major European powers, or at least by the Allied powers. They met uh, House and Wilson. Wilson and, and Mrs. Wilson came up uh, in the presidential yacht uh, to the North Shore, and the two men met together on the lodger of the Jefferson Coolidge Mansion, which is, alas, no longer there, beautiful home near House's vacation home, and looking out over the ocean, surrounded by papers, drafts, uh, manuscripts, uh, reports of all kinds, uh, they jointly prepared the first draft of the covenant. House had long thought that if Germany continued to count on her new big submarines uh, to sink the ships uh, that could starve Britain out, the United States would not in the end be able to keep out of the war. Wilson, of course, famously said, there is such a thing as being too proud to fight. Uh, in the end, it took the Zimmerman telegram to overcome even Wilson's reluctance to fight. In it, uh, when it was intercepted by British intelligence, the German government was caught proposing to bribe the Mexicans uh, to join the war uh, and to invade and recapture California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas with the help of the Japanese, not a project that any American president could easily uh, ignore. Once the United States was at war, House went back to Europe again. He failed to get the Allies to act together as he'd hoped, uh, but his great success, and House was his agent in it, was to persuade the Germans to agree to an armistice on the basis of the 14 points. Now, they played fair and straight with the European allies. They didn't conceal what they were doing from Britain and France. But what they did was, was to, to say that the Germans could have an armistice uh, if they would accept the 14 points. Now, there were a number of elements in the 14 points that uh, the British and the French would have liked to argue about. But uh, Wilson and House put them in a position where if they did so, they risked finding that the United States would leave them to fight on alone, and they therefore were not realistically likely uh, to refuse this deal. So it was really a brilliant diplomatic coup and carried out in a way that didn't actually upset or, or annoy uh, the Allies. By the way, Wilson refused to call Britain or France Allies. They had to be called Associated Powers because because they were such bad boys over the secret treaties. Um, in any case, um, that was, I think, a remarkable stroke of, of diplomatic skill. The, um, that's when the trouble began. So far, so good. In February 1919, Wilson had to go back uh, to Washington from France uh, to be present at the end of the congressional session. He left House in charge, and in a 20-minute uh, meeting, House said he thought he could button things up, I think he used that phrase, and have everything ready for the president's approval when he returned. Now, they went through a number of areas, I think there were five or six specific areas, and they discussed what approach House should take on each of them. 
um, there is a suggestion that Wilson was a little alarmed by the um, alacrity with which Colonel House said, leave it to me. Uh, but in any case, House was very careful and correct in saying that, of course, he couldn't uh, decide anything without the president's permission. When the president came back a month later, everything had gone wrong and everything proceeded to go wrong. Um, Wilson had just discovered how suspicious and bulky the Senate was. In particular, he realized, as he might have done before, that Henry Cabot Lodge, who was the new Republican majority leader as well as the, as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, um, that, that Henry Lodge, uh, who was his enemy, and they had a, an academic quarrel over an article. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge was the editor of a journal and turned down an article which Wilson had written. And that, as we know, in the academic life is not easily forgotten. Um, and um, so Wilson, up to that point, had simply, I believe, not understood how decisive his loss of control of the two houses of Congress in the midterm elections had been. And here again, we, we face a situation where there may be a parallel in our immediate future. But in any case, um, Wilson had been um, adulated in Paris. Huge crowds had turned out. He'd been admired. He'd been praised. He'd seen himself correctly as the arbiter of the world for this brief moment over the turn from 1918 to 1919. And I don't think he seems to have really absorbed how uh, catastrophic loss of control of Congress would be for his if he were going to achieve his, his plans. In fact, there's a rather bizarre episode when uh, President Wilson was coming over on the boat to Europe. He was traveling with a number of young, bright members of the, uh, of the inquiry, and one of them, William C. Bullitt, uh, said uh, um, rather cheekily, he said, Mr. President, we've been cooped up in uh, in steerage, and, and we'd really like to have a, have a talk with you. And so they had a meeting, and Wilson explained that the people he was going to be dealing with in uh, Europe did not have his democratic legitimacy. Well, Lloyd George had just won uh, the control of the House of Commons with 80% of the seats, the by far the highest margin that anybody's ever achieved in history. And uh, uh, Georges Clemenceau had just been uh, confirmed as Prime Minister of France but with the votes of 80% of the Assembly, whereas Wilson had just been heavily defeated in both houses of Congress. But it was Wilson's temperament, I mean, that was, th those were details. He was, it was his vision which was going to be inscribed on the future of the world. There was no immediate breach. Uh, according to uh, the second Mrs. Wilson, uh, Wilson was horrified that House had uh, made too many compromises. The phrase she used in her rather novelettish memoirs was, was, House has given away everything I have worked for. Uh, and, um, but in any case, it's quite plain that there was increasing uh, tension between the two men. There was no immediate breach. Wilson and House continued to work together. When Wilson was ill, which he was twice, House stood in as his deputy. But clearly the old trust was broken and the intimate friendship was over. Why? Well, part of the explanation lies in the deep suspicion that Edith Wilson had harbored of Colonel House as a re result of an episode of that crucial moment in her life when she was about to get married to the President of the United States. And at this point, rumors surfaced about some letters that Woodrow Wilson to, had written to a lady called Mrs. Mary Peck, uh, who was a lively divorcee that uh, Wilson had met in Bermuda. I cherish a wonderful picture that survives of, of, uh, um, of uh, Mrs. Peck uh, and Wilson. Mrs. Peck is leaning forward. It's rather like one of those pictures in society magazines where the caption says, Mrs. So-and-so enjoying a joke with uh, Mr. Somebody. Uh, and... Uh, Whatever to the nature of the relationship, um, it's clear that Wilson was to some extent in love with Mary Peck. Uh, it's not clear whether uh, what is known as physical intimacy took place. 
But what is quite certain is that Wilson gave Mrs. Peck a very substantial amount of money, and he did certainly feel very guilty about it. He wrote so in, in a paper for his own, uh, I suppose to clarify his own feelings, a rather hysterical paper. Edith Wilson blamed House for the surfacing of these love letters. Now, it is, I think, perfectly true that Colonel House regretted the fact that President Wilson was getting remarried so soon after his first wife's death and so shortly before a presidential election. Uh, but as it happens, it wasn't House who uh, surfaced, who leaked uh, the letters. That was done uh, by um, William Gibbs McAdoo, uh, who happened to be both uh, Secretary of the Treasury and, and uh, uh, Wilson's campaign manager and also his son-in-law. Uh, but the fact is that um, the, the spell was broken that uh, from the spring of 1919 on, um, the, the, uh, Wilson and House were no longer close, uh, trusting uh, political friends. There was, of course, more to the falling out uh, than uh, that uh, old story about the love letters. Uh, Wilson was clearly ill, more ill than anybody knew. Uh, he, had, he had already had a series of, of strokes of increasing severity. They seem, and some you know, uh, psychiatrists have, have written, um, that these strokes had changed his personality, that he was less open, more, if you like, more paranoid um, uh, as a result of uh, this, uh, these medical problems. He certainly, had, his head had been turned by the reception he'd received in Europe. He thought that he and he alone could bring about a new order in which the world's peace would be guaranteed by exporting American ideals. House, though discreet and loyal, was not uncritical. He confided to his diary uh, that he thought he could sort things out better than, than Wilson could, and some of his aides were less discreet than he was. The breach between the two friends was bitterly painful for House. Wilson never showed any forgiveness or gratitude. Uh, to be fair, he was mortally tired and, and before long desperately ill. But this was not just a private tragedy. Uh, House needed Wilson. And it's clear that House, in a measure in Paris, forgot that his whole influence depended on maintaining Wilson's trust. Without the president, the president's advisor is always nothing. But Wilson, too, needed House. House understood that if Wilson was to create a new European, indeed a new world system, based on American ideals, the consent of the governed, open democracy, self-determination of peoples, he had at least, at least better find out what the existing world was really like and he should also be more realistic than he was about the politics of his own country. As it was, Wilson's dreams evaporated and has his hopes with them. It is a sad story, but, but why, as I began by asking, is it relevant for us today? Well, for one thing, even if you do not think, as many people used to think, and as I do not think, that the defeat of the League of Nations led directly to the rise of National Socialism, there is no question that a great opportunity for building a structure of peace was lost in Paris in 1919. There was plenty of blame to go around for that. I mean, the French were terrified of, of the resurg a possible resurgence of Germany. They'd, after all, been invaded by the Germans twice in, in a short period of time and, and were going to be invaded by them again. Uh, the uh, French and the Italians were uh, greedy in their... Uh, demands for reparations. The British were um, pursuing their own interests and were rather indifferent to the, uh, rather I think rather cynical about the prospects of, of building a Wilsonian uh, uh, world. But Wilson's vision and idealism would have benefited, I believe, from House's common sense and realism. I don't use the word realism in the technical sense in which it's used in departments of international relations. But it was all very well, for example, to take an example, to denounce secret diplomacy. But it was quite another thing to lecture the peoples of Europe, as Wilson did repeatedly, and as House kept urging him not to do, about the need not to be selfish. After all, 
Wilson's interests in this whole situation were the greatest of all. Wilson wanted nothing less than for the United States to be the most indisputed uh, power in the, in the world and for he himself to be the arbiter of its, of its future. So it was rather unhelpful to keep giving speeches. He used to write this phrase about being, not being selfish into every speech and the House would literally take it out. The second decade of the 20th century sounds a long time ago, and uh, p perhaps especially for Americans who rightly like to focus on the future rather than the past, um, you know, it does seem very remote. But it was in many ways a time that bore a surprising resemblance to our own. It was for a start an age of globalization, when trade and transportation were bringing the peoples of the earth closer than ever before. It was a time of dizzying technological change, radio, movies, aviation, all invented in the 20 years uh, previous, uh, 20 years before the war began. Uh, it was an age of angry nationalism. New nations, Japan, China, Mexico, were challenging traditional structures of, of power, demanding a seat at the table, if you like. It was an age of revolution, when new peoples, the Russians, the Chinese, the Irish, the peoples of the collapsing Ottoman Empire in the Middle East and the peoples of the Balkans, all pressing their claims to be heard and their claim to govern themselves. That second decade was, I think, as I said, the last time before our own when the world's political system did seem malleable. It was uh, the beginning uh, of what Eric Hobsbawm has called the short 20th century, this long sequence uh, of... Uh, of unfortunate uh, uh, events. I've lost a page of notes here. Wait a minute, where are we? We're getting, we're getting home, but we need to find this uh, page nine. Here we are. Uh, for 70 years afterwards, as Hobsbawm uh, showed, the world spun down grooves of ominous change. World war, communism, economic breakdown, fascism, world war, genocide, nuclear nightmare, cold war. If we're not to repeat the failures of Wilson's and Hussey's dreams, I believe we must look much more closely at what went wrong at the beginning of that sequence. This was the moment when the United States found itself for the first time bearing the burdens of a world system that had just broken down. Four great imperial autocracies, the Russian, the Austro-Hungarian, the Ottoman and the Prussian, had collapsed utterly. The imperial democracies, Britain, France and Italy, were so grievously drained of resources that they lost any capacity to restore the system. Only the United States emerged from the war stronger and with a convincing vision of how the world might be. Wilson's vision was, well, Wilsonian. He wanted to impose on the world by moral influence if possible, but if not by political and even military power, American ideals as he saw them. I think one interesting way of looking at the difference between Woodrow Wilson and Edward House was that Wilson saw the world as a blank page on which he could scrawl his theorems of what ought to be or what might be. But House saw the world more as a map of realities, mountains, rivers, cities, provinces, peoples, interests, that might be surmounted but had to be dealt with before they could be surmounted. House and Wilson certainly shared ideals, but where Wilson was a visionary, an idealist, an iambic rhetorician, House was a realist, a pragmatist, a, negoti a negotiator, and a political actor. The lessons of that time and of their ultimately failed collaboration are, are many. And I think the best way I can sum them up is by reading to the last paragraph of this book. House's failures, I wrote, were large and obvious, but they were not all his own. He understood earlier and more clearly than Wilson that the United States was too strong, and at the same time its strength was too bound up with the fate of other countries, in migration, in trade, in many other ways, to remain aloof from the world's urgent moral conflicts. He was sure, too, that America's entry onto the world scene could best be achieved not by boasting about the exceptional virtues of American society, but by finding partners in other societies who would work towards the same goals. Thank you.
Shall I be my own chair? Good, right. There were so many parts of the world that were implicated in all these difficulties. You mentioned the Middle East quickly. Um, how seriously did House look at the Balfour Declaration and, and British policy toward, the, toward Palestine? Quite seriously. He, he of course, he had a, quite a close friendship with uh, Arthur Balfour, but he also was a friend of Chaim Weizmann, and he kept in touch with several of the Zionist leaders of, of the time. He wasn't particular. Well, he wasn't knowledgeable at all about the state of affairs on the ground in Palestine, or indeed in the Middle East as a whole. He, in his diary, you get a picture of of a whirlwind of people. Uh, I mean, he sometimes lists the people he's seen in a day. He's seen 30 people, you know, the, the uh, rather wanton queen of Romania and, and some African leader and a couple of barons from the Japanese diplomatic service and, and three American journalists and a traveling senator. It's quite extraordinary. I managed to keep all these, these balls in the air. But I don't, there, there isn't really very much in his correspondence or diary, about the detail of the Middle East. What is true, of course, is that, I mean, the, 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 the British and the French were not fools. They were aware that Wilson was against dealing in provinces as if they were the stakes on a poker table. So what they said is they, they just... They, 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 they didn't ask for anything. I mean, the French asked for, for uh, Alsace-Lorraine, but that, they, obviously they were going to get that anyway. Um, the French also wanted uh, guarantees against uh, German uh, resurgence, and they wanted uh, reparations. But they didn't ask for anything much otherwise for themselves. What the French said they wanted uh, was an influence over some of the Ottoman Empire's um, uh, Asiatic provinces, uh, specifically over Syria and Lebanon. And at the same time, the British said, well, we don't have any real interest, but we'd love to have a mandate to preserve the future and encourage democracy um, in, uh, in Arabia and Palestine and Mesopotamia, which is now Iraq. But, of course, what they ended up setting up uh, was more or less traditional colonial structures in, in uh, Egypt, uh, Arabia, what's now Jordan, Palestine, and Iraq. Now, I say more or less colonial structures because most of the other colonial uh, territories were not, in fact, very uh, highly structured um, administrations. They were mostly sort of uh, pretty likely ruled. And, and the same was true in uh, the, the Iraq uh, of um, 19... 20, 21, 22. Um, there's a wonderful moment when Winston Churchill, who was then the minister responsible, probably minister for the colonies, and he wrote a he wrote a note uh, to um, uh, Sir Arnold Wilson, who was the the kind of pro pro consul in charge of Iraq, saying, um, "Can you please explain to me what is the difference between the Sunni and the Shia?" Well. Uh, there was a piece in the op-ed page of the New York Times yesterday <laughs> explaining that people in Washington haven't quite sorted this out. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. Um, so the answer is not a lot of detail, but 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 a reluctance really to grapple. I mean, I mean, a truly Wilsonian Wilson, it seems to me, would have said, "We've got to talk about this." We believe that, that uh, colonial empires are wrong and we're not going to support you in uh, maintaining or, um, or uh, um, continuing them, uh, let alone reimposing them. Um, Wilson didn't do that, um, partly because I, I, he, he, he was not a detailed man. He really wasn't. Um, and partly because he was not very well and he didn't have much energy and, 
and partly because he'd suddenly woken up to find that one of his worst enemies uh, had him by the throat. Uh, and um, I think, well, somebody suggested to me the other day that I underestimated the extent to which Wilson deliberately blamed House um, because he saw that things were going wrong and he wanted to shift some of the, the burden onto on somebody else. Right. I for- one anecdote about House and Garrett, he saw Prince Faisal, mm-hmm. those of us who saw Lawrence of Arabia, who had as his aide this young British colonel, who apparently was saying negative things about Garrett in England. The House says in his diary, you better watch out because some of them may understand it. Mm-hmm. I, I forget the details, but there's a there's a point in which Wilson simply I'm not sure whether it's the Balfour Declaration itself or a memorandum about it, and he, Wilson literally finds it in his pocket where it's been sitting for weeks, because and he 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 memos House saying, oh by the way, there's this uh, there's this paper you gave me about the Jews. I don't know whether it's important or not. I mean, he really was not. He might have been sympathetic in theory to Zionism, but it wasn't at all high on his priorities. No, but Brandeis was very close to Wilson. That's true. And waited on Wilson secretly. Right. About Zionism. But I, I mean, do you disagree with my general point, which was that there's remarkably little detailed attention to the Middle East in, in, in the conference? No. Yeah. Them, but, uh, that was all part of that breakdown that we yeah. I don't think he ever focused himself on it, but he did know a lot about Europe. Uh, Captain Challenge was he said about his thinking of the world as a blank page. He had written lengthy books about European government. Uh, True. But, but for example, I, I was struck by how <clears throat> he never really analyzed the concept of self-determination. Uh, two, two points. One is he didn't distinguish between the self-determination of nations and the self-determination of peoples, which sound as if they're the same but are very different in practice. And the other is that in almost every case, where a new nation was created um, in Paris um, or allowed to create itself, because that's more accurate in some cases, that um, new nation contained um, peoples who did not determine their future. A classic example being Yugoslavia, but the same was also true of the new Poland and in particular of uh, Czechoslovakia. And you could go around and, and find that that I mean, of, co- of course, Wilson was a you know an erudite um, 
historian and scholar, but, but it doesn't seem to me that he focused on the detail at all. Whereas House had a personal intelligence service of people sort of uh, feeding stuff into him about what was going on in many, many parts of the world. And he was dealing, I think as a practicing politician does, uh, no doubt responding to some extent to the intensity of pressure. And one of the things that struck me, for example, is that House was getting letters from one of the Czech Legion as they were fighting their way across Siberia. And that was only one element in the extraordinary jigsaw puzzle of, of Russia in 1919. But the idea that House had equipped himself with an informant who was, I think, a, a captain or a major in, the, in these uh, irregular Czech forces, I thought was quite extraordinary. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if you would comment on that. Well, this is one of the only political relations that's subjected to psycho Yes, that's right. I mean, I, I, the question is how much Sigmund Freud had to do with it. <clears throat> I think Bullitt uh, went and interviewed Freud and got some ideas and, and then proceeded to write a, a pretty nasty and hostile uh, short book, which does have some, indeed, Freudian insights, but it's not. A serious piece of, uh, of uh, psychoanalysis, let alone of, uh, of psychobiography. The George's book, I, I, I read it. I didn't think it was bad. I didn't feel it. I learned anything particularly from it. What it, what is very interesting, actually, is the various medical papers attached um, to the Wilson papers. There's, uh, from memory, one or two volumes of of papers written by psychiatrists and, and uh, neurologists and others about the probable personality consequences of Wilson's uh, illnesses. And in Phyllis Levin's excellent book, there's some, or rather a, a judicious uh, sort of sifting of those, uh, uh, of those different opinions, I think. I think Wilson did feel guilt. Uh, I think the greatest, the, uh, as literature, the greatest of his speeches is the last one, when he talks about those dear ghosts who still deploy among the fields of France. It's an astonishing uh, speech. Um, I also think that, I think that he, well, I don't think he saw himself as responsible uh, for the lives of American soldiers killed. I think he saw himself as a man who'd done all that he could to prevent it. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that's true. I mean, Wilson really went on, uh, gosh, and to put it in an unfriendly way, squirming away from one situation after another when almost everybody, including House, said, my God, we really do have to get into the war. Now, starting with the Lusitania crisis and going right on until, I mean, even after, even after the Zimmerman telegram, it was a matter of weeks before Wilson could be brought up to actually accept that this had happened. Uh, he, you're right, he, he saw this as the, as the failure, the frustration of, of his vision, uh, and, and no harm in that. But at the same time, I don't think he, my own interpretation of his, uh, his personality is he was not somebody who spent a lot of time worrying about his personal guilt. I don't know, that's my impression. Let me comment about the general way in this university and elsewhere in the United States that the dead were treated, they were deified. Yeah. And Colonel Stiff 
Yale students who had died, there's 20 of them, uh, had fulfilled the purpose of the university yeah. uh, by, by dying for this, right. cause, for this great cause. So there certainly wasn't much sense of guilt generally. I don't, I don't I, I've about forgotten about this. I, I think that Stimson made a speech at Yale which, in which he said that it was a privilege for those who would go and fight and die for, for liberty, and that George Herbert Walker Bush rushed out, rushed out and joined the Navy underage on the strength of listening to that speech. Well, the, 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 the speech was actually in 1920, uh, the speech that said it was a privilege. Yes. Maybe but he gave another an, an, an one, perhaps. No, in 1940, in, in June 1940, yeah. he made a speech, and he made two speeches, one at Phillips Andover and one at Yale, and I'm not sure which one yeah. drove uh, the young Bush yeah. into the... Basically the repeating, Simpson was repeating what he had said right. about the first world. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Right. Well, what the, I, I have no direct personal expertise at all in this field, thank God. Um, what, the, what the doctors say is that, number one, that Wilson had a history of cardiovascular disease, which started with a, a stroke severe enough to have affected his... Uh, seeing his eyesight uh, quite a long time earlier, I think, let me, uh, 19, 1906, I think, um, 1909, I forget which, but way, way before the war, long before he was, uh, he was elected, that um, he then had a series of increasingly severe cardiovascular incidents, including what is now diagnosed as a, a stroke, in Paris in the spring, and then the the almost fatal one uh, in uh, Colorado on the on the tour uh, in September, I guess. Um, the 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 consensus seems to be that uh, his political skills were affected; that he was more impatient, uh, more. Uh, he clearly was. It remained, for example, an astonishingly vivid and effective speaker. Um, but he was more impatient, uh, more uh, less willing to sit down with people and listen to what they had to say, more inclined to promote his own uh, ideas rather than uh, meeting people anywhere near halfway. That 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 seems to me the. The, the pattern of, of, of the of the change, but but it does it is I think every every witness agreed that uh, that he was a changed man. From uh, actually, the, the, the dating is rather peculiar because the visit to Washington, which was a catastrophic, it, it well, everything went badly wrong, and it was from February the fourteenth to March the fifteenth, I think, and. Um, with two bits of nice, relaxing ocean travel on either end, and two weeks of everything going wrong in Boston and Washington. Um, and he came back from that, and Mrs. Wilson's account suggests that he was just horrified within the first moments of talking uh, to the French ambassador and then uh, to House uh, on the train. He then had two severe illnesses, one, a kind of flu with a very high temperature, which, however, lasted only about uh, two days. And then another illness, rather mysteriously described, which uh, doctors now seem to think was a major cardiovascular incident. 
And these, these were quite close together, but they were after the return. And if you, are a, 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 if you accept Edith Wilson's account of these things, you know, his illness may well have been the consequence of, of uh, the shock at seeing the appalling betrayal which uh, uh, Colonel Huss had committed. But my own view is that, uh, is that these were separate medical incidents brought on probably by the general stress and exhaustion of the conference because uh, everybody, it was a madhouse. I mean, any big conference, uh, uh, if you, you go to a professional conference, it lasts four days. Uh, uh, it's pretty exhausting. You stay up late at night, you talk to too many people, you uh, have too many drinks and whatever. Um, in um, this case, this went on for months and there were some extremely tough cookies pushing and bucking and shoving for what they wanted, very often uh, with, with, with rather narrow uh, obsessions, whereas uh, poor Wilson and indeed Colonel House too were trying to, trying to bring the whole thing together and to satisfy all of these conflicting obsessions. So I, it's entirely plausible to me that it was uh, both the shock of, uh, of uh, being roughed up by Henry Cabot Lodge and other senators. The, uh, the dinner party was an absolute disaster. One of the things that went wrong is that Wilson only served Apollinaris water. And these fellows, I mean, they were really not used to not having decent wine to drink, you know. And uh, they also, the cigars were not very good, so several senators uh, noted. Um, and, uh, and this was not the... Vice President's concern for a decent five cents ago, we're talking about serious Havanas that they were used to. And uh, finally, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge noticed that the First Lady's fingernails were dirty. And it was really a very ugly, bad tempered, horrible meeting. You know? And uh, uh, so that is part of the building stress on Wilson. And then, I mean, the discovery that uh, his great vision was going to have to be fought through not only the peace conference in Paris, but also the Senate of the United States. That was stressful. And then I think the sheer exhaustion of the thing uh, continued. And then finally, he goes out to try to save uh, his vision of the League in particular. And he travels thousands of miles. He makes, I think, about a dozen major speeches. And by this stage, he's in terrible shape, medically as well as uh, politically. Perhaps it's time for one more comment from Charles. <clears throat> Could you say something more about the psychology and ambition of Colonel House? He seems to fall into the category of the advisor, uh, Confucius, Machiavelli, Kissinger, <laughs> all of whom write a lot about being an advisor and what they're trying to achieve. And they all have some similarities with their own distinctive as well. What is House within the Well, I think one thing about House is he he sedulously avoided the limelight. Uh, I think he really did try to avoid the limelight, although in the end he got a lot of press coverage and and uh, he was irritated by some of it, and uh, uh, rightly so, I think. He um, I think one of the keys to understanding his personality, and I don't feel very confident about this, least of all in the presence of his grandson, but I, I think he was he was not strong as a child. He had a, a, a an incident where he, he fell and damaged himself as a child. He found it very hard to take the hot weather in Texas, pre-air conditioning. Um, he seems to have sought the secondary role, the, the role of influence rather than the role of executive authority. And I think that's genuine. There is one rather puzzling, uh, more than one actually, a couple of times in the diary where he, he sort of says, uh, um, my God, I broke my legs by tripping over a cable. I'm doing the same again. Um, uh, he, there's, a, there's a time when he says, well, I could have been made a, a senator from Texas because this is before direct election. And if I'd been senator, well, I might have been a presidential candidate. And gosh, I wonder whether I would have liked uh, being president. But I don't think he, 
he ever seriously sought that kind of authority. What he loved to feel, I think, was that he, that he was an insider, of course, and that he was influential. But also, I think, I think he did have his own set of ideals, which, again, there's this puzzling episode of, of the book that he wrote, Philip Drew, and when he wrote it, it was immediately after uh, his first meeting with Wilson, actually after two or three meetings with Wilson, when clearly the relationship with Wilson was going to be very important in his life, he then falls sick, uh, which he did from time to time, and he goes off to Texas, and, and, and at very high speed, he writes down this book, which he's been thinking about and working on for months, because uh, when uh, McAdoo and uh, the other fellow, McCombs, um, go to see him, they say, oh, the house is full of sort of uh, research papers and maps and statistics and so on. What can this man be up to? And it's clear he'd been uh, using a, a lot of his time to, to study. And then at, at racing speed, he writes this peculiar book, which is, which is partly a sort of Victorian novel uh, about Philip Drew and his love affair, and partly is a sort of manifesto for a, a rather tough-minded progressive government. And it includes an interesting episode, which I think reflects some of the political culture of the South at that time, in which um, a senator who has been uh, often uh, seen as being uh, derived from Marcus A. Hanna uh, is uh, uh, sealing everybody blind, and so Philip Drew raises an army uh, in the Southwest, and they, in a great battle somewhere in Indiana, they defeat the forces of uh, the Hanna figure, and they march on Washington, and, and Philip Drew arrives at... Uh, at, at his influence, uh, as it were, as, a, as a, the victor of a, a military campaign. And, and it's, I think it's easy to see that Colonel House is somebody who had been sort of an invalid much of his life, was, was working out a fantasy of being a, a sort of conquering uh, military uh, hero. It, it's an interesting book, a very peculiar book. It doesn't, it doesn't work as a novel at all, but it's full of interesting ideas. Well, the comparison is hard enough. Um, the world, the, the world of 1914, was very different from the world of 1919. Uh, in 1914, you had a, a sort of a polycentric world in which um, there were half a dozen great powers: Britain, France, Russia, Germany. Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire beginning to disappear, and the United States having sort of joined the company of those powers. By 1919, the United States was immeasurably the most powerful, uh, if only because uh, American industry had uh, done extremely well out of supplying the, the belligerent powers, and American uh, uh, finance had done extremely well out of, the, out of funding uh, the war. The the world of, of 1919 was a much more, it was a much less egalitarian world. Uh, it was uh, essentially uh, a world um, still attempting to preserve 19th century conventions of behavior and, and also political um, uh, ideals. And Everything that's happened, that whole sequence I mentioned, I guess, twice in my talk, uh, that begins with the breakdown of the European system and which ends up, uh, well, uh, you know, before 9-11, there was 11-9, there was the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and that is, if you like, that and the, and the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union two years later are the ends of that, of that process. So that 
the changes wrought in the world by that uh, sequence of uh, uh, disastrous events uh, between 1914 and, and 1991, um, uh, I mean, the changes are so hard that I couldn't describe them in an in a 90-minute talk, let alone in a in a few minutes. And as to the lessons we've learned from them, my God, I sometimes wonder whether we've learned any lessons at all. Um, but I think we're still in pursuit of those ideals which, which are Wilsonian, but also pre-Wilsonian, the, the ideals of um, a structured uh, peace, of organization which would be able both to, uh, you know, to develop economically the various nations of the world so that they would more, be more closely uh, equal and that that would eliminate uh, those sources of conflict that arose from, from mere hunger and desperation. So there's that kind of economic meliorism, uh, which, which, which is a thread uh, that runs through this whole period. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is um, this um, other thread, which is the uh, argument between liberal democracy and its sundry enemies. Uh, now, whether we can be said to have learned any lessons, I think, I think people have learned specific lessons. They've learned lessons about how to conduct uh, diplomacy, about communications, about many things. But, but whether we've learned lessons in the sense of being any closer to getting these things right, is, uh, I, 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 f I fear I very much doubt.